I'd like to introduce Alan Annie Olson up. Her Wycliffe uh, uh, Bible translators coming all the way from the very strange nation of Texas. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, I told them the way you were coming from all the way from the country of Texas. So, right. so well, yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know, it's, uh, let me get this up here. Special music? Nope. Special guest. We'll get there. So, um, yeah, there we are. Um, it's, a, it's a great to be here once again. Um, and we really appreciate the partnership that we have with people here at Hilltop. And uh, the, uh, it's just, it's been, can you believe it's been almost three decades since we've kind of been doing this here and working with you all and representing Hilltop in various places around the world. Um, you know, when we, first, when we first went out, we started off in hospitality, and that has kind of morphed into other things, and our, focuses, our focus, or foci, has, uh, has changed over the, over the years, and uh, we have a little bit different roles now. So, And we'd like to explain kind of where we're going and where we've been. So. In 2006, I met an SIL colleague who had done tech support for a lot of years. And when I told him that I was doing type design on a computer, he told me about a type time when he had to do type design. He took a key off a typewriter and filed off part of a letter to make it right for the translation team. That was a workable, in fact, that was the only solution in those days, um, but it's a little different now. A field worker in Western Africa needed a font suitable for the language community that he was working with. My type design teammate, Becca Spallinger, had a lot of interaction with this fellow about what the style should be, and she also did a lot of research on her own. She sent him a trial version of the font, and shortly afterwards he sent a report in the form of the following story. Imagine if the pastor preaching your wedding, sh wedding ceremony showed up looking like this. Okay. Okay. Like, done. Okay. That's now. We're the tech people, we're not we're the tech. Ah, there we go. <laughs> so no matter what he says this day, Nobody's going to remember. It won't matter because the shock of his attire is going to prevent you or anyone else in the room from hearing a word that he says. So sometimes sticking to the expected format in a, a given situation really matters. For example, we can't simply show people the Bible in letters that you and I can understand that we read every day. We want people to hear the life-changing message of the gospel, but it's got to be in the right format in some situations. If we show the people of this language community the Bible in the letters that we read, they'll be offended. They've been taught to associate those letters with an increasingly godless Western culture, and a wall goes up and they think, God would never speak to us in letters like that. But over recent years, this team has been working to put the Bible into the preferred local writing style. Now, a little over a week ago, I greeted a respected religious teacher in a village. I sat down and I handed him a draft copy of Genesis chapters one through three in this new format. And as it fell into his hands, he scanned the first page, his face relaxed and his eyes gleamed. Immediately, he began to read it out loud. His friends, who were sitting nearby, craned their necks to see what he was reading from. And he was gaining speed. He started, he started um, getting more and more caught up in it. They were looking at the difficult words and pointing and helping them out. And he began smiling and gesturing emphatically as he completed each verse. He finished the first chapter. Everybody else was following along. And I still hadn't said a word. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Not only had this religious teacher gladly received the word of God in this new format, 
but he began distributing the pages to the people to take home and look through. And as I left the village, men were gathered into little groups of two or three, showing each other the scriptures. Now, this language worker knew well what was the wrong package. Okay. That, all right. Oh, okay. Sorry, we're... This is two, two different things that we're <laughs> trying to keep coordinated here, so... Okay, so for sure it was not this. this. And it wasn't this one either. But what he needed was this one. Yeah. Scripture in this language of Western Africa is on the verge of being typeset using the now completed Alcolomy font. And it'll take about a year to set the entire Bible. It, the font itself was released in, uh, in May of 2017, and since then it's had about 1,800 downloads. So that's just a download. Who knows how many people are using it for what? And this language group will receive the scriptures, not only the words, but the way it should look. Shortly after the start of translation work in the Bende language in the Katavi region in, Can in Tanzania, a group of Bende men and women gathered together to review the final drafts of Jonah and Ruth, the very first scriptures in their languages. After the translator read a bit from the book of Jonah, there was a feedback for feedback, but the group was silent. Finally, one reviewer nodded his head in delight, and he said, when he read it, it was like he was straight, talking straight to me. So those are the type, that's the type of impact that we want to see when people read God's word, and it really hits their heart. In my new role in Wycliffe, uh, I'll be going back to the Katabi region, to the Pembe and, and, the, and the Bende people, and in May, I'll be checking under progress and to encourage them. This area in Tanzania here is where traditional religion has a really strong grip on the people. And, um, and I can give you a, a short description here, if you're interested in reading and learning more about the people, the Pembe and the, and the Bende people, um, because they have God's word impact like at first did, it's going to need prayer and people standing in prayer with them. So if you'd like to get some more, I'd love to be able to, to put that in their hands. They have a goal that by October, they'll have translated the scripture from Luke that is used for the Jesus film. And once, once that is done, they, they, can put, they can start the Jesus film and they can show the Jesus film to the people. There we go. So I'd ask you to pray, pray for the people, the Bende and the Pembe people who are working um, on this translation, that it would have a powerful impact on these communities. And also praying for my time in the Katavi region in May, that it may be profitable for all the people, you know, as we move forward and uh, look at other translation goals that they may have. So I'll have Annie talk about our time in Kenya. We got lots of stories, but little time. So um, I just want to thank you for supporting us and thank you for praying for us because God put us in a wonderful church while we were living in Nairobi for the last three years. Um, and it's a, it's a solid biblical church, all Kenyan leadership, um, great small groups. We had a wonderful small group that we were part of every week and... Um, it's, I, I could tell stories about all these people, and this isn't everybody. So it was just a real joy to be in that cultural context and learn from people who loved the Lord the same way that we did, um, just with a different perspective. And I just am glad to say that we 
also continued our tradition of hospitality. In 2016, we figured that about half the year we ha had somebody staying with us, and one of those was this young fellow, Simon, from uh, Switzerland, who came to volunteer for about nine months, and for one of those months, he lived with us, and it was just a lot of fun. So this is our Swiss son. Yeah, and actually, um, Simon here, it's, it's been really fun tracking this relationship between Annie and Simon, because he'll kind of go, you know, I want to know this girl, and I want to get to know her better. What do you think? You know, and it'll, so we've had some really good, fun uh, interactions with them. So again, what, we can't say it any, any more that, that uh, we really thank you for your partnership. We have um, prayer cards from the back, and um, we also have a, a, our latest prayer letter in paper, not just in electronic. So thank you very much for your time. We'll also have a sign-up sheet there, too. Well, thank you, Alan, Annie, and uh, faithful is a word that comes to mind when I think of both of you, and uh, you have been faithful serving the Lord in, in a whole lot of different regions and, and contexts. Now, um, you're, you were in Nairobi, now you're in Texas, but you're going back to Tanzania. Uh, is Texas going to be your home base? Yep. Okay. Um, and then you're going to be commuting to, to Africa, right? Yeah, I'll be the only one. I'll probably go in for maybe a week, maybe 10 days, maybe two weeks at times, depending upon what, what needs to happen. But, you know, I mean, really, I kind of look at it and I kind of go, part of me kind of goes, you know, what was that Tanzania thing all about, Lord? You know, I, we had a great time in Kenya. What was the Tanzania thing? And, you know, you, you kind of walk out in faith and you kind of go, okay. I have those relationships with many of those people, and I'm just really grateful for that. So that's, that will, I'll continue to build on that and use that and hopefully glorify him through all that. And this dovetails with the font work, which happens to involve this uh, launch of the, of the Bible in the um, heart language of the folks in western Tanzania. Yeah, certain yeah. region. Certain mm -hmm. region they use that style of, of Arabic. Okay, yeah. okay. And you can, do, uh, you can do the font work from Texas, wherever. Yeah, wherever. Okay. Yeah. How can we pray for you guys? Oh. Pray for our kids. Walk with the Lord. Because mm -hmm. um, there's some pieces missing now currently, and it's just, that's a concern for us. Um, so that's one big thing. Um, just pray for us to stay strong as we look at, you know, kind of finishing well. We, we don't, we're looking at another six, seven years maybe of active service. Not ready to retire yet. No. So. All right. <laughs> okay, well, let's, uh, let's pray. And uh, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for Alan, Annie, and just their decades of serving you uh, and and lord we um thank you for the fruit that is about to be born as your word is um issued in the heart language of the people in western tanzania and remember reading that uh, there's there's a lot of spiritism and witchcraft in that area and and lord might your spirit just speak so powerfully through your word that uh people could clearly see the difference and place their faith in Isa, Jesus Christ, as their Lord and Savior. Uh, we, we pray for Alan and Annie's kids, that they would uh, be able to uh, counsel and advise uh, in that new role as uh, adults and, um, and, and just trust you with the rest. And, and Lord, we just pray that you'd guide and direct in these remaining six or seven years that they have, that they would be the most fruitful of all and we just thank you for the relationship that we have with them and we thank you in jesus name amen, amen. amen. Um, i do want to share with you and and sort of remind you one thing that uh, the saturday night service this is our last uh saturday night meeting in this building 
Uh, next week, we're going to move over to the other building. Uh, it'll be a little bit more intimate setting. Not a little bit, quite a bit more. Um, the room will fit sort of the size, uh, the group that we have here. Um, we really want the service over there to, uh, we believe that the building will help us uh, gather together more. We're going to structure the service a little bit differently too. There'll be opportunities for more interaction, more fellowship. Um, and, and I think it's an exciting thing. If you have kids, uh, continue to bring your kids over here for Sunday school. You'll check them in the same way you have been. Um, what will happen, though, is at about 725, the children's ministry will bring all of the kids over to the other building, um, and they'll be, uh, they'll be checked out of an office over there. Uh, it'll be really clear which one will make that obvious. But uh, next week when you show up, uh, come to the other building, and, and we really are excited about what's gonna, how we're going to sort of shift the service a little bit and really try to bring us together more. Um, the, the worship will be acoustic, and uh, probably Josh and somebody on a, on a cajon, that's the drum that they... Not a drum. I don't know what it is. I'm not a musician. But they know. So that's good, right? Um, but just next week, that's what's going on. And then, uh, let's see. Tonight, we're in Mark chapter 14. Uh, we're looking at uh, Jew Jesus before the Jewish leaders. And uh, when Joel kind of laid this out, he said that th these passages aren't so much Jesus on trial as they are the people around him on trial. Uh, I mean, when you look at it, Jesus is he's, he's on trial here. But really what's happening is the people that are around him their heart and their motives are being exposed. Um, and as we look at this, what we see is that actions that are motivated by self-interest will put us at odds with God. Uh, you're going to see a group of people who their actions are 100% motivated by self-interest. They're worried about taking care of themselves, their power, their position, uh, their wealth, their possessions. That's really what motivates them to do what they do here. Now, Ken Boa writes, our souls become emaciated, uh, they're weak, uh, they, uh, they, they're emaciated. Our souls become emaciated when their pleasure is affixed to position, possessions, and power because these things are to, destined to corrupt and perish. When we affix our souls, when we say that, that my life and, and, and where I'm finding life, it's going to come from a position that I hold. I have this title. I have this place where I'm above these people, and because of this, I'm better, right? If we, if we affix ourselves to position or possessions, I own these things, and I have this, and I have that, and I have a lot of wealth, and, 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 or I don't have a lot of wealth, and so, oh, no, you know, whatever the case may be. But if we affix ourselves to position, this place that I hold, possession, these things that I own, or power that we can wield, our souls become weak. They, they break down. Um, and, and these things are destined to corrupt and perish. Anything that is temporal, if we affix our lives, if we say, I live for here and now in the temporal, that's what all three of those things are, whether it be a position, possessions, or power, uh, they're all temporal. They, they won't last. They'll corrupt and they'll perish. Uh, when I was a kid, I had a childhood friend. Uh, his name is Mike. And Mike came from a family of like 13 kids. He was the youngest. He had, a, he had an oldest sister that was like 40 when we were in high school. Um, it was different. But anyway, the whole family was skinny as a rail, right? And Mike was this guy that he could eat like two pizzas. And he, if he turned sideways, you might miss him, right? He was just so skinny. And it didn't matter what he did. He couldn't get bigger. He could just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And nothing would happen with his body. And that's kind of Boa's point, that when we feed on the wrong things, it doesn't matter how much of them we take in, we won't grow. We won't be satisfied, right? And that's the idea that we're going to see in this passage, is that these people, they're, they're feeding on things that could never satisfy. And when we feed on things that could never satisfy, what do we always need? More. And if we always need more, then that means that we're willing to push aside anybody to get it. It means that we'll hold somebody down. It means that instead of looking to serve and bless those in our lives, we're looking, what can we get from them? And Jesus, on the, on the flip side of this, he shows us a totally, totally different way of approaching life and where satisfaction comes from. So I want to set up the passage we'll be reading. We'll be in... Uh, Mark chapter 14, we'll read verse 53 and then 55 through 65. And where we're at here is Jesus has been betrayed, right? This is the last night that Jesus will spend on earth before his crucifixion. Within hours, actually, Jesus will be on the cross. Um, but he's been betrayed by Judas. He's been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's prayed and he sought the Father's will, not your will, but mine. If you take this cup, that'd be great, but I'm going to do what you want me to do. And I've come for this purpose, and so I'm going to see this through, right? And now uh, he's been arrested, he's being carried off, and he's going to go on trial. And then after the trial, there'll be beating and mocking and uh, scourging and crucifixion. 
But he's at the end here. And so let's read this little by little. Verse, uh, verse 53 of chapter 14 of Mark says this. They led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests and elders and scribes gathered together. And then move on to verse 55. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death, and they were not finding any. For many were giving false testimony against him, but their testimony was not consistent. Some stood up and began to give false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy the temple uh, made with hands, and in three days I will build up another made without hands. Even in this respect, their testimony was not consistent. And so the picture we have here is that the Jewish, the Jewish religious leaders have reached a point where they're not going to put up with Jesus anymore. And one of the things that taken, has taken place is Jesus' triumphal entry, right? He rides into Jerusalem Palm Sunday, and, and he's riding on the donkey, and, and, and a crowd gathers around him. And in John, it says that after that, the re religious leaders are talking to each other, and they say, look, the whole world is going after him. Everybody's going after him. And if we don't do something, we're going to lose our, our position and our power. That's what they're concerned about. If we don't do something, we're going to lose our place and our position. And at that point in time, they determined that they're going to kill this guy. He's, he has to die. And the reason that they're worried about their, their power and their position is because the Roman government has put them there sort of as somebody that the Roman government pulls the strings through. And so their, their goal is not looking after the people or, or serving God so much as it is appeasing the Roman government. And a Messiah, somebody that will come in and say, let's revolt, which is what they thought Jesus was, that, that says if he does that, we lose the position that we have. So he has to go. And then that's their motivation. And so when they go and they seize Jesus in the garden, they, you know, they'll do whatever it takes. They're going to hang on to their position. If they have to lie, okay. If they have to cheat, if they have to bribe somebody, if they have to pay off one of his disciples, uh, whatever it takes to accuse this guy, let's do it. And that's what we've seen to this point. They pay off Judas. Uh, they, they go get... Jesus from the garden, uh, now they're gathering witnesses that just, you know, to make up a story that will help us accuse this guy. Whatever it takes, lie, cheat, steal, whatever, we have to accuse him. And it says there in 58, it says that we heard of him say he would destroy the temple made with hands and in three days build another. Uh, Jesus actually said something like that, but not exactly this. And so they can't get a consistent uh, testimony to, to get him. They can't, they can't actually get him yet at this point. But they're willing to do anything. They're willing to do anything to, to, to take Jesus down. And as we go through this passage, I think it's important, it's really easy to sort of look at these guys and go, wow, look how messed up they are. And in our lives, it's really easy to look at others and go, wow, look how messed up they are. But what we get far more of out of a passage is when we see the example of somebody who's against God and ask the question, where is this happening in my life? Right? This is a grand scale. They're actually... ...Jesus down physically, literally. But where does this happen within our own lives? Where are the places that we say, you know, I, I'm going to do this my own way? And what life apart from God is, the, the goal is anonymity. I want to do this on my own. Right? Satan, the, the, one of the most powerful created beings, what does he want? He leaves heaven because he wants to do things his own way. He enters the, the Garden of Eden and he tempts men and women. What does he tempt them with? He tempts them with, you can do this your own way. You can have anonymity. You can be a part of from God. And what we see is this desire to be apart from God, it manifests itself in so many ways. And, and so when you look at this, you have to say, where does this show up in, in me? It's really easy to see it in these guys, but where does it show up in me? Where are the places where I say, I want distance from you, God? I'm going to use my time in this area how I see fit. I'm going to use my money in this area, not to, to bless others, but I, I'm going to be selfish with it. I'm more concerned about me and mine, and I'm going to hoard it. Or whatever the case may be, I'm going to use my relationships in a way, not, not in order to bless people, but in order to take from them. I'm going, to, I'm going to do things my way, not yours. What are your priorities? 
And so these are questions we have to ask ourselves. Are we, are, we, are we submitting to God? Are we taking up our cross? And when Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, anyone who wishes to be one of my disciples has to take up their cross and follow me. Uh, taking up your cross is not like this burden you have to bear. The point is that you, in order to follow Jesus, you have to, re, 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 you have to reach a place of submission where you say he truly is God. And, and not, just, not just like a demanding God, but he's this God who loves me. And as we see in this passage, he's willing to show me a way to live that's totally different from the way I do this on my own. And he's willing to, to give and sacrifice for me. And he's willing to give his life for me. And you see that this Jesus that we follow isn't this like evil, scowling God, but he's this God who, who desires to bless us. But, he, but in order to bless, he says, you have to recognize me as God. And so in these guys' lives, it's really clear that they're going to miss out on who God is because they're, they're totally fixed to temporal things. And so are we totally fixed to temporal things? Or are we living for something eternal, something that will last? Who's leading you? Yourself or are you, are you following God? Verse 60 goes on. It says, The high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus. Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? In other words, they're, they're bringing these charges against you. What do you have to say about it? But Jesus kept silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Now, we have to understand who this high priest is. The high priest uh, at Jesus' time is Joseph Caiaphas. He's the son-in-law of a man that was uh, the high priest from 6 A.D. to 15 A.D. And in 15 A.D., this man was deposed as high priest. Rome came in and said, you're not doing a good enough job. We're going to put somebody else in. Um, and then this, this guy, Annas, he remained kind of a godfather to uh, controlling the reins of power. He had five sons that held the, five sons or sons, son-in-laws that held the position of high priest. So he sort of worked with the Roman government. Okay, I'm not good enough, but I have this other guy. Give him a shot. And what we, what we know about the position is that it afforded tremendous wealth, power, and influence. It was a position, this, this guy was probably in our, in our modern day, he's a millionaire, right? He's a rich guy. Okay, and so it affords wealth, it affords power, it affords influence. Before Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, uh, there was a guy named Valerius Gratus, and he was the governor. And in his time, he removed four high priests in 11 years. And so what we see with this position is that it held power and wealth, but it was also volatile and subject to rapid change. Caiaphas, however, held the position for 18 years. He held the position all the way through Pilate's governorship. And when Pilate was no longer governor, the new guy came in and said, I'm, I'm reorganizing things and I want a new high priest. But what we see with Caiaphas is he's somebody, he's, he's very good at politics and he'll do whatever it takes to hold his position. And that's really what we see here is that he's going to do whatever it takes to hold his position. And so what he does in this passage is, is we see that he can't get the, the testimony that he needs from witnesses. They needed two witnesses to have the same story about Jesus that would then give them the opportunity to say, there it is, we, could, we have a charge against him, two witnesses, it, it's verified, we have a charge. And they couldn't get consistent. So he basically says, okay, if I can't get a consistent witness, let's see if we can get the guy to incriminate himself. I'm going to ask him a direct question. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? But his willingness to do whatever it takes to hold on to this position. I don't know if you've ever done this in your life where you're like, I think, I think I, I'm learning a little bit more about this God, right? And I, and I kind of get who God is, and I lo- know a little bit about who Jesus is, and I get the sacrifice, and I get that I need it, and I, and I understand the resurrection, and, and I, yeah, I can go for that. God, raised, God has the power to raise somebody from the dead. He's God, right? He could, he could do that. But I don't know about this whole submit thing. I don't know about this whole give my life over to him. I think I'd rather hold on. I think I'd rather keep some distance and, and do things my way. You're right. I mean, the culture around me, it says that this book is just full of fairy tales. And the way they live is no, the way they lived here and the, and the, and the, and the, the standards that God has, that's not really relevant anymore. So I, I think I'd rather just keep some distance. There are parts of Jesus that I like. But this whole, like, live according to where he would lead me, I, I'm not so sure about that. I'm going to hold on. And we can do that. We can, we can get glimpses of who Jesus is, and he'll reveal himself to us. And we hear the word preached, and we hear who he is. And here's this God become man who lives a perfect life and dies on my behalf, and he deals with my sin. He lives, and, and he dies a ransom for many. And, and I believe I need a ransom for what I've done. 
and, and, and you get a little, little bit closer, a little bit closer, but then you say, you know what? I think I'd rather hold on to where I am. I want to do things my way. And then once, even once we believe, even once we've reached a place of salvation and we trust Jesus for death, burial, and resurrection, sin is dealt with and new life is given, there are still times when we can say, you know what, I, I don't know if I want to do what you have for me here, God. It sounds difficult. It sounds like it would be way easier over here. And, and that's really what's going on here is, is, is I'm gonna, the high priest is going to hold on to his position. And we can, we, can, we can fool ourselves and say, I have this position where I'm, I'm good on my own. And I can feast on the things of, of the world, positions and, pos and power and possessions, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fool myself, but in the end, it won't satisfy. Or you can realize that all those things don't add up to what God has for you and move forward and grow into the, in relationship and grow closer into conformity with the image of Christ. The sanctification can happen. But Caiaphas is going to hold on to this position and he'll do whatever it takes. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. Verse 62, Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And what we see here is Jesus makes no secret about who he is. Uh, he sort of uses Psalm uh, 110, verse 1, and pardon me, Daniel uh, chapter 7, verse 13, and sort of... Uh, combines them together in his answer here. Um, and then what we see is that a lot of times one of the criticisms you'll hear of Jesus and, and, and the Bible itself and the Gospels in particular is that, that uh, it wasn't until the Gospel of John that Jesus' deity was really pushed forward. And they'll say, like, when you go to the Gospel of John, it's really clear that at that point in time, Christians believed that Jesus was God. But if you read some of the earlier ones, you don't see it that way. It's not as, it's not as clear. And what you see here is that Jesus' answer, he says, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And Ryrie notes, the members of the council understood clearly that Jesus, in Jesus' answer, he claimed equality with God. And since they viewed him as a mere man, this claim was blasphemy in their minds, and the penalty was death. That's Leviticus 24, 16. So the language may not be as obvious here in the earlier Gospels as it is in John, but any degree of research, you go, Jesus is claiming to be God here, and that's why they put him to death. That was the charge that they had against him. And when Jesus said, I am, he, he knew the sentence of death would follow, because these people did not believe. But he also knew that this was exactly what he came to do. He came to give his life a ransom for many. His love and determination, uh, the love and determination of God to bring people back to him is on display here. I am, and I will bear the cross, and I will go there, and I will drink that cup, because I will do whatever it takes to seek and save the lost and bring you, me, back into relationship with him. He'll do whatever it takes. So you have two very different whatever it takes here. There's one man who's saying, I will do whatever it takes to hang on to my position, my power, my possessions. It doesn't matter who I have to hold down. It doesn't matter who I have to push away. It doesn't matter what, what hypocrisy I have to commit to do it. I, I have standards, and I will break them to hold on to what I have. And then you have Christ on the other side who is determined. I will live out the role that the Father has for me. And I will declare who I am, and I will go to the cross, and I will be a ransom for many, and I will suffer and endure for you, for me, to have relationship with God once again. Two very different, I will remain separate and do this on my own, and then I will give, I will, I will take, and I will push, and I will harm I will give, and I will sacrifice, and I will die. Two very different things going on here. Verse 63, tearing his clothes, the high priest said, what further need do we have of witnesses? In other words, these guys that couldn't tell a good lie, we don't need them anymore, get them out of here. He just did it himself. You've heard the blasphemy, how does it seem to you? And they condemned him to be deserving of death. Now, blasphemy is to slander, detract, or otherwise speak ill of one's name. Um, it's, to, it's, to, it's to make somebody out to be someone they're not. 
And in this case, they're talking about God. It's to make God out to be someone he's not. So the high priest says that Jesus' messianic claims and his claims of equality with God are false and therefore injurious to God's name. And the hypocrisy is, is incredible. Here's a guy who just broke a whole bunch of rules. They had standards. Uh, they had their own standards for how do we hold a trial and when can it happen. And, and instead, let's, let's arrest him at night and have a secret one. And he breaks all the rules in order to go accuse this guy to hold on to his position. And, and if anybody's a hypocrite here, it's him, right? And, 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 and he says, here is the guy or if anybody's guilty of blasphemy, right? Because who are, the, who are the priests? They're the people that are supposed to represent God. They're, God. they're supposed to represent God to the nation of Israel, and then the nation of Israel is supposed to represent God to the world. And they're saying, uh, here they are willing to break all of their own rules and God's rules in order to hold on to their position. They're showing God to be somebody that he is not. And we, we've all had times in our lives, followers or, or, or not, followers of Christ, where we've, where we've blown it and we've represented God to be something he's not. But the, the, the point is repentance, and he is unwilling to repent. He condemns Jesus. He, he pushes him away. And perhaps the best thing that you could have handed these guys at this point in time was a mirror, Right? Uh, John Foreman is a singer and a songwriter. I like his music a lot. He has a song where he says, I could try to point the finger, but the glass points back in my direction. Right? A mirror is harder to hold. It's easy to point at everybody else and say, this is what's wrong with you. And the crazy thing is, is very often this is what Christians are known for, is this is what's wrong with all of you. Right? We're up here and better, and this is what's wrong with all of you. When really what, where, where, where change starts... Where, where the life of God is manifested is when we look at ourselves and we say, where do I need to grow? Where do I need to change? It's really easy to point the finger. It's really easy to point the finger at God and say, you blew this and you blew that. But really where we need to look is within ourselves. And that's what Christians should be known for. They should be known as humble people like Christ. We should be known as people who say, what, what, is, what is the evil inside of me that needs to be dealt with? What is the wrong inside of me that needs to be dealt with? And then how do I live this same kind of life where, where Christ was willing to give to the point of death? Not a, not a pious place where I think I'm so much better than everybody else, but how do I live this kind of life that Christ lived? And, and the answer, the answer, the answer is that in Jesus Christ's resurrection, he raised us from the dead and he gave us new life and he sealed us with the Holy Spirit. And God's, present li God's presence lives inside of us and we carry the living God everywhere we go and he wants to empower us and move us and conform us to the image of Jesus. But that's what God wants to do within us. And instead of pointing and, and looking at others and telling about everything about what's wrong with others, we need to look inside ourselves. And what is the change that needs to take place inside of me? For these guys, it was a willingness to recognize that their power, their position was in the way of what God wanted to do. And they were so opposed to God, we see here in verse 65, some of them began to spit at him and to blindfold him and beat him with their fists and say to him, prophesy. And the officers received him with slaps in the face. The idea here is let's blindfold him, and if he's truly God, then he can tell where the next punch is going to come from. They're mocking him. And what we see in the end is the desire to hold on to power and position leads these men to literally slap God in the face. They literally hit God in the face. But in but the question then becomes, in what ways do I, figuratively, do I figuratively do this? In what ways am I so stuck on what I'm going to hold on to that I, that I slap God away? So in this case, uh, we, these people, it causes them to literally slap God. Uh, and these are the obstacles that are before them, is, is they're going to hold on to power, and they're going to hold on to position. They're going to hold on to separation from God, basically. If someone gets in their way, they're gonna, they'll mock, they'll despise, they'll abuse. All those things are acceptable, whatever it takes. 
Paul would describe all of these deeds as deeds of the flesh, mocking, despising, abusing, doing evil. And flesh is always self-seeking, whereas Christ is always other-centered. Flesh injures and abuses. Christ heals and uplifts. When these negative set of actions, they, when those are the things that characterize us, we have to realize what power we're walking by and how we need to walk in God's strength. But the big thing to see here, and I think it's two things that are really important to walk away from this passage with. One is there are many cases where people will hold on to the temporal so hard, power, possessions, and position. They'll hold on to the temporal so hard that they miss out on who God is. And it's not just people, but there are times where I will hold on to the temporal so hard that I miss out on what God is doing and what he has for me. So then the question becomes, as, I, as, this, as, this, as God's word is before me and, and, and as Jesus' way of life is before me, is, well, God, what is it in me? What places in me am I holding on? What places, where is it in my life where, I'm on, where I miss out on you and what you're doing because I'm going to hold on to these, these things? So I think that the first thing is, is this examination of ourselves before God, before his word. What, what areas do I need change? And I think the second thing you have to grab onto here is how much Jesus Christ loved us and how loves us, and how willing he was to do whatever it took to get us. I mean, this is amazing how much God loves us, and how willing he is to do whatever it takes to get us. That cross before him, the arrest, the beating, uh, what, what, was a, what was before him, he, he was going to do whatever it took. He'd already prayed that through in the garden, and God, I, not, not my will, but yours, Father, and, and I'm going to see this thing through. And then the thing that has to strike us is that if that's how Christ lived, and he calls me to be conformed to his image, how on earth am I going to do that? How on earth would I be willing to give of myself and take these temporal things that, that I want to hold on to? How, 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 am, how on earth am I going to get to a position where I'd be willing to just lay them down and say, I don't know, you want to use this position I have? Use it. You want to use these possessions I have? Use them. What do you, how do you want to use these things? God, they're not mine. How do you want to use them? And I think those are the things that have to strike us in this passage is where do we hold on to the temporal so hard that we miss out on God? And how is God leading us to lay those things down to love him and serve others? Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you so much for your son. Lord Jesus Christ, you had a determined, uh, a determined will, and it was to bring me, us, back to you. Uh, sin and rebellion are, are just part of who we are on this earth, and yet you came after sinners and rebellious people. Me. You came after hypocrites like, like the men in this passage and like me. And you laid your life down and you gave it a ransom so that, so that my sin and my rebellion and my hypocrisy could be done away with. And you've raised me up to new life so that those things no longer have to characterize me, but now I could be characterized by your life and your love. This is what Christianity is. It's a doing away with the old and rebellion and sin and hypocrisy and a raising up to new life. Uh, there's self-sacrifice and a willingness instead of taking from others to give to others. It's an amazing gospel that you would take, the king of the universe would take people who rebelled against you, that you would die for them, that you would bring them back, you would ransom them away from that old way of life and bring them into a brand new way of life where you give and give and give. So we thank you for that life that, uh, that you've given. What an amazing thing it is to think about who I once was and who I'm becoming in you. I pray that that's a story that we share often, who we once were and who I am becoming in you. And it's because of your willingness, your determination, that any of that is possible. So we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.